When we start a new project, Blender automatically creates a cube primitive. The orange outline around the cube tells us that it is selected. Although we can use the Outliner Editor to select and deselect objects in our scene, the simplest way to do this is by left-clicking the mouse within the 3D viewport. Click anywhere in empty space to deselect all objects. And click over an object to select it. To delete any object, we must first select it and then press either the Delete key or the X key. Pressing Delete removes the object immediately while pressing X produces a small dialog box to verify that we really want to delete the object. If we've made a mistake, pressing Ctrl Z will undo our last command. In this example we'll start by getting rid of the cube. To create a new mesh, we can either use the Add Mesh option from the 3D Viewports menu or we can just press Shift A to produce a pop-up Add menu and select Mesh from there. The Meshes submenu offers 10 different choices. For the most part these are the primitives available in Blender and we'll normally start our modeling by adding one of these to our scene. The plane is the simplest of all primitives since it consists of a single face with its four edges and four vertices. Immediately after adding the plane to our scene, a small panel will appear in the bottom left of the 3D viewport. This is known as the last operation panel. Clicking on the arrow will expand the panel to show us the settings relating to our newly created plane. We can adjust these values in order to make changes to the new plane. This panel only exists until we perform some other operation, then it will disappear and generally cannot be retrieved. So, we must be sure to make any changes required now before moving on. The first and most obvious value here is size. This tells us that the plane is initially 2 meters by 2 meters. If we type in a new value here, we can change the size of the plane. Generate UV involves how any texture image we might assign to the plane later is applied. We can ignore this for the time being. Align specifies which set of axes the plane is aligned along. At the moment its front face points in the direction of the positive end of the world's z-axis. Changing the setting to view, aligns it along the z-axis of the view axes and therefore it points directly out of the screen. The 3D cursor setting will be covered in a later video. Location specifies the plane's location in 3D space as measured using the world axis. If we enter a new position, the plane will move so that its origin is positioned at the new location. Rotation specifies the angle of rotation about each of the plane's global axes. Rather than enter a value directly, most of the Blender fields allow us to drag the mouse over the data area to change a value if we don't require an exact value. If we drag a new value into the X field, we'll see the plane rotate about the X axis. And although we can rotate the plane about all three axes, Observing the effect is best achieved by changing only one value at a time, so we'll reset the X rotation to zero before rotating it about the Y axis. And finally, we rotate it about the Z axis. Deleting the plane by pressing the delete key and then adding a new plane, we can see that it has the same 5 meter size as we'd set for the previous plane but the location and rotation values have returned to zero. Deleting this second plane, we move on to the next primitive, the cube. The last op panel has exactly the same parameters as the plane. As with the plane, any change in the size value will be used by subsequent cubes. Next we come to the circle. And like the plane, this is a two-dimensional shape. But initially it contains only vertices and edges without any faces. The last op panel also has some new parameters. Vertices specifies the number of vertices in the perimeter of the circle. Since edges are always straight, we need quite a few to give the illusion of a curved circumference. But we can reduce the number to as low as 3 at which point we end up with a triangle rather than a circle. Radius specifies the radius of the circle. Fill type specifies how we want the circle's faces to be constructed. Initially there is no fill. But we can choose either end gone to fill the shape with a single polygon, or we can pick triangle fan to add a set of tri-faces with a common point at the center of the circle. The difference between the last two options is best seen in edit mode, but this does remove the parameters panel. The other options in the panel we've seen before. Vertices, radius and fill type settings will be used in subsequent circle that are created. The next primitive is the UV sphere. 
segment sets the number of vertical columns of faces while ring sets the number of horizontal rings. Reducing these values can create some interesting shapes. Notice that most of the faces on a UV sphere are quads except for those at the top and bottom, which are tries. A line view will adjust the sphere so that its top is pointing out of the screen. Other values, we've seen before. Segment, ring and radius settings will be reused when a new UV sphere is created. The ecosphere is yet another sphere but this time all the faces are tries. Subdivisions divides up the tries. But be careful to keep this number to single figures otherwise your computer may struggle with the number of faces that end up being created. Subdivisions and radius will be reused. Moving on, we come to the cylinder. Vertices specifies the number of vertices on the top and bottom of the cylinder and hence the number of vertical faces. Again, reducing the value can create shapes which bear little resemblance to the original. Radius affects the width of the cylinder. Depth changes its height. Cap type defines the type of face used to cover the top and bottom of the cylinder. Like the circle we can choose between a single end gone face, or a set of tries that meet at the midpoint. Nothing will leave the cylinder open at both ends. A line view points the top of the cylinder towards us. Vertices, radius and cap type will be reused. The seventh primitive is the cone. Vertices sets the number of vertices on the base of the cone and hence the number of faces leading to the top of the cone. Radius 1 sets the radius of the cone's base. Radius 2 set the radius of the cone's top. For any value other than 0 we no longer have a true cone. In fact, if we set the two radii equal, we have an alternative way of creating a cylinder. Depth sets the height of the cone. Base fill type with the usual options of nothing, n gone and fan, affects not only the base of the cone but also the top if radius 2 is set to anything other than 0. A line view points the top of the cone towards us. Vertices, radius 1, radius 2, depth, and base fill type will be reused. The donut-shaped torus offers the most options when it is created. In fact, it is so complex that we can save any setting we create in the operator's presets list at the top of the panel. We'll return to that in a moment. Major segment sets the number of vertical rings of faces. The higher this number the more circular the torus. If we lower it to its minimum value, we end up with a triangular torus. Minor segments controls the number of horizontal rings of faces around the torus. There are two ways of defining the dimensions of a torus. Which we want to use is selected from the dimension modes drop down list. Major slash minor allows us to set the major and minor radii. The major radius is the distance from the center of the torus to the middle of the solid ring. The minor radius is the radius within the solid part of the torus. The second way of setting the size is exterior slash interior. Exterior radius is the radius from the center to the outer edge. And interior radius is the radius from the center to the inner edge. A line view rotates the torus to give us a view looking straight down its center. Because of the complexity of the torus's setting we can save the current settings by clicking on the plus symbol beside operator presets and then assign that set of values a name. The next time we create a torus we can choose that name from the drop down list. Even without making use of operator presets, major and minor segments values, and dimension mode and its settings are retained. A grid may look exactly the same as a plane, but when we select it and enter edit mode we can see the difference between the two, while a plane is made from a single face, a grid has 100 faces by default. 
this gives us many more options when we start to manipulate the individual elements of a mesh in edit mode. X subdivision determines the number of faces in the X direction while Y subdivision sets the number of faces in the Y direction. Any subsequent grids we create will have the most recently set values for these two parameters. Finally, we come to the monkey mesh. This is hardly another primitive in the usual sense of the word, but the monkey head, which is called Suzanne, is Blender's mascot. Actually, Suzanne can be quite useful when we want to test out some Blender feature on a more complex mesh. As we'll see in a later video, it's a simple matter to make Suzanne look much more impressive. It's worth mentioning at this point that we should always try to keep the number of faces in a mesh as low as possible until we have finished reshaping it. The more faces we have the more there are to reshape. This not only increases the processing required by the computer but usually makes the reshaping process more complicated. There are simple ways to increase the number of faces once the final shape has been arrived at. Also, we don't always need to add faces to create a better appearance. For example, it may seem obvious that we'll need to increase the number of faces on a sphere to create a realistic curve to its surface. And, although this is true if we intend to 3D print our model, when our final result is to be a still image, an animation, or a game asset, there are other ways to create a smooth curved surface. Let's start with a UV sphere and half the usual number of segments and rings. At this point the flat faces that make up the sphere are very obvious. However, if we select Object Shade Smooth from the 3D Viewports menu, the sphere surface becomes much smoother and takes on a more curved appearance. Blender hasn't added more faces, it has just adjusted the vertex normal values when calculating the shading. In fact, the only thing that gives away the true number of faces on our sphere is the straight edges on its profile. But even this isn't a problem if the sphere is only to be viewed from a distance in the final render. Smooth shading does have its problems though. Let's try the same approach with a cylinder. This time we'll keep the default settings. When we apply Shade Smooth, the overall effect looks rather strange. This is because Blender is trying to smooth out the area where the sides of the cylinder meet the top. To stop this we need to check the Auto Smooth box. This tells Blender not to smooth the join between faces that are at angle of 30 degrees or more. We can change the angle value if necessary. Now our cylinder has a much more realistic appearance.